when I came to Ramana Maharishi's teachings, Suresh Nantarajan, on awakening to our real nature. There I could find the synthesis of inquiry, love and compassion and all of it. So it was not just intellectually satisfying, which it was, but it was also much deeper than that. It is Ramana Maharshi's emphasis on inquiry, self-investigation, Suresh says, that leads to true self-awareness and understanding. If anything, the more people who are awakened to the reality of their being as not you know, identified with any projection of thought and therefore not have any identity around your thinking or your feelings or your emotions or your body, then that can only help humankind. The only thing that matters in this journey is, am I free this moment? And that freedom is available to every human being right now. And learning all this seems daunting, but Suresh says no. There is nothing difficult about it except the thought that it's difficult. Welcome to Soul Journeys and to this closer look at the benefits of self-inquiry with Suresh Natarajan. This interview was recorded in New Delhi, India and San Diego, California on Wednesday, July 20th, 2022. Suresh Natarajan, welcome to Soul Journeys today. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for having me. You're certainly welcome. How long have you been drawn to the teachings of Ramana Maharshi? You look to be a very young man, so it can't be too many years, but give us an idea. I was living in Seattle at the time and uh, I was generally not satisfied with life, even though I had everything that one could reasonably ask for uh, and more. So I started exploring some of the deeper questions and uh, for some reason, even though I grew from a, grew up in a traditional background, I was not initially drawn to uh, the traditional religion as it is practiced. So I kind of uh, stopped going to any of those kinds of activities that people tend to go to. But yet I was feeling something was missing. So I started um, reading, exploring, Soon enough, somehow, you know, I got in touch with Ramana's teachings. And uh, before that, I was, of course, reading a lot of teachers, uh, doing different practices even. And uh, I realized that all of them were somewhat fragmented. Uh, and um, also the idea of belief is something that I've always uh, been resistant to because Belief is just a projection of thought and you can believe just about anything and uh, it doesn't really stand the scrutiny of inquiry if you actually look into it. So when I came to Ramana Maharishi's teachings, there I could find the synthesis of inquiry and love and compassion and all of it. So it was not just intellectually satisfying, which it was, but it was also much deeper than that. Did this resonate with you immediately or did it take a while for you to warm up to it? It was actually pretty immediate for me. When I first read Ramana's teachings in a book, and interestingly, that book was less about the teachings and more about Ramana, the, the, the person, if I can say, say that because he was really, it's, there is no personality as such when you are truly rooted in the uh, knowledge of oneself. But that being said, how he interacted with people, the reminiscences of various people who interacted with him was what I first read. And through that, the teaching also came through because the teacher is the teaching and the teaching is the teacher. They cannot be separate. And that separation is what you find in, in, you know, when that separation is there, there is fragmentation. And uh, in, in the case of Ramana, there was no such fragmentation because the teacher and the teaching were one and the same. So it resonated with me immediately. So what is it that you must search for 
on this path? There is no seeking because when one is clearly rooted in the in the in the inquiry of what one is, who one is, then life just unfolds in its own way, and uh, every every happening, every event has its own beauty. That's all. You said it very well, I think. Um, I've been to your website. I'm not sure how much of a public website it is or how old it is. It's Suresh N, is in the first initial of your last name, Suresh N 13.medium.com. And when I was looking through the pages there, uh, I see that you like to write a lot about Ramana Maharshi's teachings. Are you? I don't really know you that well. Are you also a teacher of self-inquiry? And if the answer is even vaguely yes, what's your modality? What's your mode of teaching? Uh, first of all, I, I don't look at myself as a teacher. Just a spontaneous sharing that happens whenever something comes up. Uh, and I do it either through the written word or the spoken word. There is no plan around it and there is no intent to be a teacher because um, that's just another role the ego likes to take on. It, when there is a sharing, it happens and the sharing comes from the same source and it, it gets out there and that's it. Are teachers even necessary? Much of self-investigation is highly personal, silent work. It turns into a rather solitary path and the student finds his or her own way after a certain point, and there's no need to either teach or seek teaching. Am I sort of on the track there in your opinion or experience? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I, I See, the thing is, when, when you are exploring this question of who am I? Yes. The, the first thing we see is that all the perceptions are happening within me, right? So whether it is people, objects, you know, what the senses perceive, what uh, events that are unfolding, the thoughts, the emotions, all of these are happening within one's consciousness. And so, therefore, there is nobody to teach. Uh, there is only oneself. And one, when one sees that all these appearances are simply emanations and consciousness that come and go, and even if we look at it from a very a scientific standpoint, it is just a play of the uh, brain. So neuroscience, for example, says that the brain is where all the images are formed, all the sounds are formed. So all the perceptions of the senses that we have are actually not out there, but happening inside the system. So that play of forms, whether it is uh, forms in, the, in, in terms of gross objects or in terms of subtle forms like thoughts and emotions and feelings, they are all happening automatically, as it were. The only thing that we do, which is the root of all our problem, is that we identify with the apparent self that is projected in that form. And so to call oneself a teacher is one more identification with the particular form. And when you renounce all the forms, because the forms have their own place, so there is a momentary rising and falling of uh, the I that happens all the time, just like when we are talking, I refer to myself as I because that is the most logical way to refer to oneself. And so there is always the rising and falling of I in its different avatars. And if one takes any of them to be oneself, then that is the root of um, delusion or ignorance, including the identity as a teacher. And the identity of the higher self, the true self, when is turning attention to it correct? We cannot give attention to the higher self, right? That very idea is dualistic in nature. Who is giving attention to what? There is a ground of awareness 
in which everything is unfolding. And you cannot think about it, you cannot talk about it, you cannot describe it, you cannot feel it, you cannot even attend to it because all of that is just another play of the mind and it again is back into the realm of the duality of forms because it just becomes another abstract concept that you focus on is what it is. So that's why it's traditionally also called the unnamed or unborn or indescribable and so on. It's only defined in negative terms. So you cannot attend to something that's described only in negative terms. So what is important for us is to negate the idea that I am found in any of the forms that are rising. Whether it be gross form as this body or whether it be ideas such as the race I belong to, the nation I belong to, the, the idea that there is a teacher and a student, any such idea that rises is based on a false identification. So if I simply see it clearly and negate the false I that is rising and falling on its own, then it's left to its own devices. And when it's left to its own devices, it actually turns out functions perfectly. Because what happens in, in most cases is when I think of myself as the speaker, the thinker, the doer, I bring in the past into the present. I bring in the memory of who I am and what it means and whether I am I'm judging myself, I'm judging the other person, you know, all kinds of secondary processes are happening when I am attending to the false self. So when I stop doing that because I see the falsity of this apparent self. See, when I refer to myself, I refer to myself using the first person, first person pronoun I, but that is just because there is a momentary rising and falling of the I that is happening all the time. And as long as I just use it for communication purposes and for the for the particular interaction and then the next interaction comes with it a different eye and different eye and I don't have to attend to it in the sense of thinking of that as me or as, as a permanent entity that is pervading through all these various eyes. When I, when I stop doing that, when I see that all of these are momentary, temporary rising and falling of the apparent subject eye, which is dealing with the apparent object, then what remains is just a certain silent ground. But the moment I try to conceptualize that ground of silence or attend to it, then I am back in the same trap. So neither do I try to attend to the false eye, nor do I try to attend to the so-called higher self, but just simply be. That's basically what it is all about. I think you just described very well why, relatively speaking, um, rather few people seem to be embracing this. It's a, it's, a, it's a steep hill to climb because I could see myself getting the picture, walking down the sidewalk with one foot in the foot of open to fuller awareness and yet the next footfall would be on the sidewalk in a puddle where my foot would get wet and it'd bring me right back to the self I was mostly familiar with. But it's this path is filled with these traps. You said it well. I, I think there are traps because the traps are the ways of the mind. Mm -hmm. Right. So So the conditioning we have which is so deeply ingrained is to think that there is an entity here, there is a soul, there is a spirit, there is a uh, an ego, or there is a mind. You know, all these are basically synonymous terms. And uh, traditional religion emphasizes it, culture emphasizes it, psychology emphasizes it that there is a psyche there, um, there is a 
there is an ego there, there is a mind there, and all of that. In reality, what is there, if you look at it carefully, is that there is just a flow of thoughts. And every thought divides itself into subject and object. There is a subjectness, which is the apparent I, and there is the object, which is the you, and there is the interaction, which is whatever we are doing, and there is time and there is space. Now, if I look at it carefully, all of this is constructed within my consciousness. And same with you. Sure. Uh, I am not here. I am constructed inside your brain. And so is the words I am speaking. So is time in which we are interacting. So is the space in which we are interacting. So if you look at it carefully, even from a pure scientific standpoint, because one has to make, there is no reason for us to abandon a scientific spirit. In fact, it has to be encouraged and how it beautifully ties in with true inquiry. So if you really carefully look at it that way, uh, you will see that everything is constructed in my consciousness. So the world I inhabit is a world only I inhabit. And the world you inhabit is a world only you inhabit. Heavy stuff, this important lesson. But Suresh clarifies it in a way that's very helpful. And, and you said, I'm sort, you're sort of a creation or a fabrication within my own brain. The question to me would be, are you in my dream? Or am I fully in your dream? I think focusing on is to leave out the idea of others, right? Because all, so so when I'm, when I'm giving any objective reality to others, I'm already in the trap of ignorance because every other, so, so, so where is the question of your dream or my dream? Because the, both the I and the you are just perceptions. And when I look at it carefully, all I find is that the perception that there is a subject, which is the I, and the perception that there is an object of, for that subject, which can be a person or a thing or an idea or whatever it is, all of these are happening in their own automatic way. And the next thought that comes has a different subject and a different object. So the idea that there is a common subject between all these different manifestations of the I is the root of our ignorance. So for us to look for an I in these thoughts is where we tend to lose ourselves. And as you gave the nice example of sticking your foot in a puddle. Now, what happens is in that moment, we are losing our alertness because the event has the power to take our consciousness to identify with the one who has put the foot in the puddle. So what is necessary for us is to have great alertness and vigilance. That is the only thing that's necessary in this journey. And by the way, I stay away from the word path because path gives the connotation of attaining something mm -hmm. in time, in space, going somewhere. We are not going anywhere. We are not reaching anything. We are just turning within and seeing who we are. And, and the moment when we are not caught in the false identification with the rising of the I, in that very moment, we are free of that. And that is true freedom. Now, for us to project that that freedom has to be always, there is again another thought. And therefore, what is important is, are we free this moment right now? And so when I am, and that requires vigilance and alertness. So instead of projecting time and questioning, which is a very common thing for us to do is, am I always functioning like that? The word always again comes out of thought. So instead of asking the question, am I always functioning like that? The only question that matters is, am I 
right now identified with thought and that is the question who am i so any time any moment any event happens that question is not even verbalized but if you are just alert then the very alertness is the questioning and in that alertness the identification with the false i is removed or it's not there and what remains is unspeakable but that is what you are mm -hmm. so we have to just commit to that alertness because the conditioning of the mind is so strong that it wants to pull us to use so, so, so as somebody put it well the mind wants the there is only one mind because all the thoughts you think and i think and everybody thinks are coming from the same source you don't think any new thoughts i don't think any new thoughts we would travel anywhere one of the good things about traveling is that you find no matter where you go people think, think the same thoughts desire the same desires fear the same fears so there is no difference between your there is no such thing as your mind and my mind there is just mind and it has its own way of wanting to survive by using the consciousness of various individuals so when one is alert and vigilant thereby not getting caught in the trap of the false identification with the subject object division and if that alertness is there moment to moment that is all there is in this journey and as for ramana maharshi and the question he poses for others to ask who am i Suresh says to keep that question alive always. The only thing that matters in this journey is am I free this moment? And that freedom is available to every human being right now. And that is the true nature of this inquiry. It is not about projecting time. It is not about creating an idea of a state of being and aspiring for it but it is about <clears throat> am i right now identified with the perception that's happening within me and when i am very clearly focused on it that is essentially the question who am i that ramana maharishi points to so the most important and the only thing that matters really is keeping that question who am i alive this moment not verbally but non verbally even which is to simply negate the perceptions that are happening as and when it happens and when when that happens you are using a couple of phrases like the you know whether it is consciousness or awareness but i think a better phrase would be to just say simply being keep that question alive this moment and every moment is this moment and the question is who am i yes you know when i first came to the teaching uh, the question didn't make sense to me because there are even people i know who are using it like almost like a mantra trying to intellectualize it uh are trying to understand it right so it is not about understanding anything it is not about intellectualizing it is not about repeating the question mechanically which is what people do when with that kind of a practice it is about constantly being in discernment you know there is another beautiful word in, in it's used in sanskrit language called viveka uh, that word means discrimination or maybe a better translation is discernment between the false and the true the question who am i is no different from discerning between what is false and what is true so you don't have to verbalize the question even what it is is to keep the question alive is to keep the discrimination or the discernment alive which is to see that every moment when anything rises as sense perception or thought or emotion or feeling it has its own life it comes it lives and it goes and it is only a perception in consciousness when you are able to keep the discernment alive that is to keep the question alive and when that question is alive in the form of discernment not as a intellectual understanding or as a, a mantra then you realize there is nothing to understand actually 
<laughs> that is absolutely uh, nothing to understand. That's reassuring to hear. Um, my experience was to try to verbalize to myself the answer to the question, who am I? Uh, one day I realized that the only fitting answer seemed to be silence because there would be no way to verbalize the answer to who am I, if that's the question you're asking. Uh, and, and then one day further, it made sense to me, of course, that would be an appropriate answer because I'm not the thought of the answer, who am I? I'm not the mind generating those thoughts. I'm not the Ted uh, who is more formless than he's formed. Hence, the only true response is almost a sense of bewilderment, silence. What answer can there be? Is that completely far afield from where a person might be headed? Or is that close to the mark? No, I, that, that's 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 good. I, see, I, I think the, the only thing that is uh, important to point out is understanding happens in time, right? And then it becomes a memory. And then the memory is put to use the next time an event happens. So you are then trying to live out of the past to face the present moment, so to speak. So the only, so the reason, you know, understanding is very useful when it comes to transactional matters, right? I need to understand how to use the computer or how to make a meal and all of that. But when I make self-knowledge into a matter of understanding, then I am essentially making it an object of memory, whereas memory itself is happening within consciousness. So that is the reason why it is not about understanding. It, it's not just a cute way to say it. It really means there is nothing to understand because understanding is only a process of memory. You know, as they say, the, the true place where the rubber meets the road is to keep the inquiry alive this moment. And that takes no understanding, but just discernment. Let me put it differently. Understanding involves, again, the same subject-object division. Whereas when you are discerning, you are simply negating the false. You're not even trying to ascertain the truth. You're just negating the false. What is the satisfactory answer to that question where a person earnestly wants to know how to pursue self-inquiry? The thing is, there is no answer in the realm of the intellect or thought, right? So because if I tell you it is silence or consciousness or awareness, these are all ideas. The, the mind immediately makes an idea of consciousness, of awareness, of silence, uh, and any such expression, right? So the reason, you know, we are programmed to always look for answers because that's, that's the way the intellect operates, right? And the intellect seeking answers to problems and that is the role of the intellect uh, so that is the, that is the way we build tools we build science i mean we, we understand technology and all of that right but but that very tool is absolutely not of any use except to clear the ground so you can clear the ground a little bit through an intellectual understanding uh, but beyond that what you have to realize is that any answer that satisfies the intellect is not the answer. <laughs> it's the, so, the intellect, but nothing else. Exactly. So why do I even look for an answer is the question you have to ask. Or again, who is the one asking for the answer? So when you look at that, the, the very I who is looking for the answer is just another projection of thought. And you are not that. It's happening in you. That hits home pretty close, 
uh, for me because sometimes I find myself wondering why am I even pursuing this line of questioning because of an intellectual curiosity to learn more answers to questions that come up all the time. And perhaps it would be better to hang up my reporter's uh, jacket and uh, forget about following the intellectual curiosity and just be in the, abide in the eye, as they say, uh, rest in awareness. Um, that has many rewards. It requires you to close down something that seems to be so vital to the existence of humankind. And it causes you to look at the question, what humankind? That what intellect, what person? So these conflicting waves in the ocean can really be confusing to, to anybody, certainly to me. Again, words fail. Yeah. Words do fail, but one thing important to point out is, I don't know why we say that we have to ignore humankind or we have to ignore anything actually, because what happens here is when you are not separating yourself within the perception that you are having as the world, then there is no other. So when, when, when an interaction happens, the interaction happens. And there is no projection of even the idea of love or compassion or any of that, because that again involves duality. But it is a natural side effect or outpouring of this realization because when you are not identified with the body as the eye with your th with your thoughts as the eye or with your feelings as the eye then everything is one dance one movement and that dance goes on uninhibited and it can involve all kinds of things. It can involve uh, whatever humankind is doing. See, right now, the human consciousness is very deeply, deeply stuck in this idea of separation, and which causes identity, and that plays into politics, that plays into culture, that plays into all kinds of things, and causing wars and uh, so many problems, right? So. If anything, the more people who are awakened to the reality of their being as not you know, identified with any projection of thought and therefore not have any identity around your thinking or your feelings or your emotions or your body, then that can only help humankind in a beautiful way because you are then free of racial divisions, religious divisions, cultural divisions, and all the rest that is plaguing humanity. So actually, what I would always say is, these fears are coming out of the old mind that is refusing to go. And we have to see it for what it is and not give it any currency. And again, ask the same, you know, it is just one question, whichever way we put it. As I said, it's not a verbal question, but you have to again ask, who is worried about all this? It's the same thing. It's the same subject object perception that is creating these thoughts and the thinker and, and wanting to not let go of it. This has been very interesting, although it's also been very difficult. I, I want to not only thank you, but ask you maybe a final question, which is the practice of self-inquiry, the study, uh, understanding the teachings of Ramana Maharshi. I'm still trying to learn it myself. What do you advise to people who really wants to move forward continually on the, I won't say path, uh, in this effort? No, I, I, I hear you. So, you know, <clears throat> one way to really easily look at it, which is basically the same as self-inquiry, but maybe it resonates better, is to completely accept each moment as it is, right? That is actually the same. It may look different, but it, it's and it may actually resonate better with, with many because every moment happens 
with its own intelligence in its own way. There is a million set of events apparently that is brought you and me together, for example, in this conversation and similarly with everything. And sometimes you put your foot in a puddle, as you said, or sometimes you uh, get into a bad accident. Sometimes something beautiful happens. Do not question why it happened. It should have happened that way. It could have happened that way. It, you know, but instead to completely accept every moment as it unfolds. I think maybe that is um, an easier way to resonate with it because that acceptance is coming out of your being. When you are fully accepting each moment as it unfolds in its entirety, including your reaction, because you as you take yourself is also part of the moment. So you are not dividing yourself from the moment and accepting what happened. If you are having anger or fear, accepting the anger, accepting the fear, accepting the the entire movement of what comprises the moment, if you can completely and wholly accept it, uh, that is actually resting in awareness too. That is simply resting in your being. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of practice with that. I've I've, I've had to learn, like we all do, how to accept all that's bright and beautiful, and ugly and uh, hurtful in life with some sense of equanimity. Uh, learning that word and the meaning behind it has been a steep curve for me, but I see, I see the correctness of that. You learn from all of it. I would even venture to say, I learn more from the adversity than from the good times. Uh, yeah. The perception of good times and the perception of adversity. It may not be that at all. So uh, I'm just going to give the last word to you. It's a real challenge for me to meet somebody who's got this grasp that I can see you easily have of this subject. Thank you, first of all, for this opportunity. And uh, it's been great talking to you. And the only thing I want to emphasize is because you mentioned it a couple of times that the idea that this is difficult is just an idea. And we have to realize that all these judgments are coming out of thought. So the easiest way, you know, perhaps, and that's why I wanted to mention it when you ask this question is to be accepting fully and you know the one thing that we need to do is not be judging ourselves as to whether we are getting it or not because all these judgments of whether i am getting it whether it is difficult am i understanding it as well as someone else uh, will i ever get there every single idea is only an idea and when you describe very well those moments when you completely accepted what happened, you were free in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that freedom is your real nature. Yeah. And that freedom is everyone's real nature because it's simply being as we are. All that is needed is a is a alert vigilance each moment, as we already said. And that alert vigilance can either be in the form of inquiry where I am seeing that what is unfolding is not me, or it can be a complete acceptance of what's happening. Because if I am vigilant also when I'm sticking the foot in the puddle, I am not going to be upset by it. I just accept it fully. I don't have to. So self-inquiry is then not a verbal process. It is just simply a, a deep acceptance. And the deep acceptance happens by simply seeing that what is happening is happening perfectly as it is. And out of that seeing, the response also comes. It's not a passive seeing because once you see it, the response comes out of it automatically. You go and clean your shoes or whatever you have to do, but you don't have to spend any cycles of your brain cursing or worrying about what happened. You just respond intelligently to what is necessary. 
And so therefore, if you are vigilant and alert each moment and not sleepwalking through life, then in that alert vigilance, if you accept everything as it unfolds, or if you see the apparent falsity of all that unfolds, false meaning not like illusion, I'm even saying, just that it is just a play and it keeps on going moment to moment and you are not to be identified with any of that. So if you look at it either way, it is bringing you to the same space of freedom within. And that is our real nature and that is available here and now, always. Thank you, Suresh. I'm going to use a very um, peculiar word to summarize what I just heard from you. This was so refreshing. It was uplifting. And I, I profit from it. I hope others do too who see it. And I'm in your debt for appreciating how you could bring something rather compelling and at times confusing and make wonderful sense of it for the benefit of those who hear you and see you talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate it.